We were assigned to a high altitude base, forward operating base Sharana in Paktika province, Afghanistan, an area where we mainly focused on fast paced and exciting helo borne vehicle interdictions. Our quarters were atop a big hill, high enough not to be so dang hot all the time. The living conditions were actually really good. The squadron before us had built it up and left us with an awesome gym with a huge 70 inch or possibly even 90 inch flat screen TV. All I remember is it was really big. We used it to watch workout videos and after we were done working at night we went in the gym and played video games. At the time Guitar Hero was really big. We turned the volume all the way up and nobody cared. We were in a gym after all. Johnny and I would play intensely competitive games of Madden NFL. We competed at everything, including who could make the best French press coffee, and the gym was where we had our fantasy football draft. Did I mention we had a bar in there too? It was mainly to have a place where we could congregate and talk shop, make French press, and have a dip. It was pretty good living. We'd get missions every third day or so. Most of the truly high value targets had moved into Pakistan, but we had a lot of intel on IED makers, and we loved to hunt them because they were responsible for so many American casualties. They knew our tactics now and understood that they were vulnerable at night. So they'd have one house where they made the bombs during the day, then they'd slip back into Pakistan when it got dark. We'd try to hit them when they were commuting. They'd usually be on motorcycles, they could ride the heck out of those things. Our intel guys would get a beat on them and we'd mount up and off we'd go to hunt from the air. That was the most fun I ever had conducting ops. Because you knew you weren't going to be out there long, you wouldn't be walking your butt off, and you'd get to shoot at moving targets out of a helicopter. It was fun, like I said, but still plenty dangerous. One of our new guys found that out fast. He'd just graduated from selection training and got on his very first vehicle interdiction. We caught up to the usual group of bad guys on motorbikes and started shooting in front of the bikes to stop them. Our Gatling style six barrel minigun could fire 2,000 to 4,000 rounds a minute, so it wasn't something you could simply ignore. One of the bad guys decided he wanted nothing to do with us. He jumped off his bike and ran toward a field in the chest high grass. I was pretty sure we'd hit him, we saw him go down, but now he was somewhere in the middle of that field in uncertain condition. We landed the helicopter in front of where we'd seen him go down and got out in a line to sweep the field. I was in the middle and the new guy was right next to me. Our plan was to keep walking in that line until we found him. It was a dangerous tactic. At any moment he could pop up and start shooting, but we were counting on having fast reactions. We'd covered maybe half the distance when blam, something blew up just 20 feet ahead. A human arm flew out of the high grass right between me and the new guy. He followed the arm with his eyes and then turned to me and asked, Hey Rob, did you throw a grenade at that guy? One of the other guys in the line said, no man, that was an S vest. Welcome to Sharana. What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. Thank you so much for checking the video out. I hope you guys enjoy it. If you do, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. But if you don't enjoy the video for any reason at all, please feel free to hit that dislike button and leave me a comment down below letting me know what I can do to improve my future videos. Any and all feedback is greatly appreciated here. What you guys are hearing right now is coming from Rob O'Neill's book, The Operator. I have a link down in the description where you guys can buy this book. As you guys know, this is one of my all-time favorite books ever. We have covered a lot of different SEAL Team operations from this book here on the channel. It is just an incredible book, and Rob O'Neill is an incredible warrior so i highly recommend purchasing his book and giving it a read if you haven't already like i said it is 100 percent a favorite of mine also i want to give a quick shout out to all of the patreon supporters over on patreon you guys 
are amazing and you help me do what I do here on the channel, sharing all of these stories. If you guys want to join the Patreon, it's where I'm working on posting some more combat footage that I can't show on YouTube, as well as just some behind the scenes stuff coming here soon. So if you guys want to support the channel, that is a fantastic way to do so, and I'll have it linked down in the description. But with all of that, guys, let's continue on with today's story. One day, Intel picked up four motorcycles speeding off from an IED manufacturing house. We launched in two helicopters. When the bad guys saw us, they split into two groups of two and went in different directions. I was in Chopper 1 and we went after one group. Chopper 2 went after the other. The guys we were chasing ditched their bikes and started running up a hill really fast into some trees so we couldn't follow from the air. Touched down on the low ground. Tactically, we shouldn't have given the enemy the high ground, but it was the only place we could get out to chase them. As soon as we hopped off, we started taking fire from up the hill. They were shooting close. The bullets zipped loudly past us. This wasn't a good situation. It was one of the few times when we were fighting at a disadvantage. Mostly on missions, we had other teams situated in other buildings. Snipers on the roof, rangers in blocking positions, and ultimately air protection. This time, we didn't really have any of that, and we were on the bottom, so we had to move up to them. If those dudes got set up on the high ground, it was going to be a long night. In that moment, I was oddly aware of myself in a way that didn't often happen. It was a how did I get here feeling. I felt completely calm, no adrenaline. I was a craftsman, and this was a technical problem to solve. Like okay, we need to get this piece of lumber level or the door won't fit. It was just, hand me that level so we can take this guy out. I called my boss on the radio. Just thinking, I said, I'm going to take these two guys here with me on a fire team. We're going to flank. He rogered that, so we left the rest of the team and the dog, Cairo, one of our best dogs and one I'd personally bonded with, to hold that side of the hill. I took Harp, our bomb disposal guy, and one other guy to maneuver off to the side to try to flank the shooters. As we were moving around the hill, we got an angle on one of the bad guys and fired. He went down, apparently dead, but you never know for sure. We had to go up the hill to clear him. When I was still a few meters away, I could see he was lying on his hands. When I see someone lying on his hands, that means he probably pulled the pin on a grenade and is just waiting like the other guy in the field because he knows he's going to die anyway and figures he might as well take you with him. I stopped where I was and said, okay, enough of this. I grabbed Harp, the explosive ordnance disposal guy, and said, I may need you to clear him. These EOD guys amaze me. It's a very dangerous job, but it's what they do, and they get right to it. He had no special equipment, just experience and ice in his veins. I walked about 30 meters away while he began to cut the pants off with scissors, starting from the boot up looking for any sign of a bomb. I was just hanging out while he took his time and did his tense and meticulous work. All of a sudden he shouted, oh my god, get over here. I was like, no, I am not into it dude, sorry. He said, no, 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 seriously, he doesn't have a bomb, come see this. The bad guy may not have been packing a bomb, but he was definitely packing. Let's just say, if he'd been an American, he could have made a fortune in the adult film industry. As we were joking about this unexpected anatomy lesson, our radio squawked. Hey, we've got an FWIA. That means friendly wounded in action. Our little moment popped like a bubble. We asked who it was. We never say a name over the radio, so we expected a call sign. But this time they said, friendly wounded in action is Cairo. Whenever a dog gets shot, it's just over. I remember thinking, we just lost Cairo, the best dog we ever had. We got the story later. As we were doing our flanking maneuver, the other half of our team sent Cairo after the bad guy. Cairo, a lean Belgian Malinois with a black muzzle, went tearing up the hill. He leaped a wooden fence and sniffed his way to the base of a tree. The bad guy had climbed into the low branches out of the dog's reach. As Cairo snapped and growled, the guy hit him with a burst from his AK-47. One bullet pierced his leg and the other penetrated his working vest and lodged in his chest. Cheese, Cairo's handler, 
couldn't see what was happening, but heard the shots and wanted to get his dog back. He used his remote to shock the dog's collar, a signal to return. Poor Cairo, conscious but critically injured, couldn't jump back over the fence, but Cheese didn't know that. Even with two bullets in him and near death, Cairo dragged himself along the fence until he found an opening. Obviously, it took him a long time. When he finally arrived, Cheese wanted to smack him for not coming back as soon as he was signaled. But then he saw the blood matted fur. Cairo had taken a bullet from the bad guy, so one of us wouldn't have to. Now that we had the guy's position in the tree, thanks to Cairo, the team spread out around his location and shot him off his perch. But Cairo was in bad shape. We all assumed he was dying, but Cheese wouldn't quit on him. He called another member of our team who'd been a medic, who treated Cairo exactly as if he'd been a human seal wounded in action. He shaved the wound, put on a chest seal, and applied pressure so Cairo wouldn't bleed out. But everyone knew that chest wound was very bad news. They called for a medevac. When the chopper arrived, Cheese and our point man, the medic, loaded Cairo in and flew with him to Bagram, where they got a plane to Germany. None of us held out much hope. Three days later, we got word. Cairo had survived. He wouldn't only fully recover, but before long, he'd help make history. If you guys didn't know, Cairo actually went on to be a part of the raid to kill Bin Laden. But that is going to be the end of today's video. Thank you guys so much for checking it out. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, all of this is coming from Rob O'Neill's book, The Operator. I have a link down in the description where you can buy it, and I can't recommend it enough. You definitely definitely should check out this book if you haven't already but hope you guys will have a fantastic rest of your day thank you so much for checking this video out and i will see you all in the next one